All right. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me and can you see the title slide? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, so now we're going to start getting into some of the actual math of risk assessment and we get to see, uh, get to find out who was telling the truth and who lied on the secretive quiz you just took. Um, so quick show of hands, I can't see everyone in the room, so maybe Adam can just give me a rough sense. Quick show of hands, how many people have had at, at least one course, class, or some training in probability and statistics? Raise your hands. Looks like we're capturing most of the room, Dave. Okay, so the follow-up was gonna be how many people have had practically none? Nobody's so, living up to that. Yeah, so that, well, that's okay though, because a lot of times, you know, as engineers at best, we've maybe had one course in it as part of our college education. And um, so anyway, we're gonna cover a lot of material. This is really condensed. Um, you are not gonna learn everything about probability and statistics that you need to know for risk analysis. But if you've had some exposure to probability and statistics, hopefully this will be a, a motivational refresher to kind of motivate you to go back and maybe study some of this stuff as you get involved in risk analysis. So the things we're gonna cover during this presentation, at the end of the presentation, we'd like you to um, learn three things. One is to recognize some of the key terms, definitions, and notations that we use in uh, from probability and statistics that we use in risk analysis. We want you to be able to apply some of the basic concepts of uh, theory and probability theory and perform some of the basic calculations that you need to do a risk analysis. So the bottom line up front is every risk analysis is built on this foundation that includes that theory, uh, probability, theory, and statistics. So if you don't uh, build a strong foundation, you're not going to have a strong uh, risk assessment. So set theory gives us a framework for uh, describing and analyzing events and the relationships between those events. So as was mentioned during the PFMA lecture, and as you'll see throughout the week, risk analysis is about um, sets of events. Probability theory gives us the math that we need to um, describe the risk equation, right? Which, if you remember, is the, the likelihood of um, loading, the performance, and the consequences. And then statistics gives us uh, a discipline to deal with the collection, organization, analysis, interpretation, and presentation of data. So we deal with a lot of information, a lot of data. And risk analysis statistics helps us with that. So let's go over set theory first. Uh, again, set theory is about events and, and more importantly, the relationships between the events that make up our risk analysis. So an event describes a specific outcome. Uh, these outcomes can be uh, numbers or categories. So, for example, uh, a number type of event might be that the annual maximum spillway flow is greater than 10,000 cubic feet per second. And a category event might be that there is some sort of flaw that exists in the foundation of a levy. Uh, we can use set theory uh, to describe relationships between the events that make up a risk analysis. We can do that graphically using a Venn diagram. And a quick definition here, the set of all events that make up our risk analysis is um, called the sample space. Here's a couple examples of some uh, event types portrayed on Venn diagram. So an event is a re as we already talked about, it's just a specific event. Uh, collectively exhaustive events are events that cover all of the possible outcomes that fill up the entire sample space. So this is a, just a simple example with uh, showing either internal erosion initiates or it does not. There's no other option. So that covers everything uh, for that specific event. It's exclusive are events that cannot occur at the same time. So if you have uh, spillway gate failure as a failure mode, you can let's say you have two spillway gates at your dam, you could have zero, one, or two spillway uh, gates failing, and those events cannot overlap. Only one of those events can occur, so they're mutually exclusive. A few more important types of events that we use to build our risk analysis and perform risk analysis computations. So complement, that little apostrophe symbol, there you'll see other notations for it. That means not. So if we want to describe um, an event not occurring, we can use that notation. So overtopping is, is represented by the red circle 
not overtopping is represented by the rest of the sample space. Intersection events are important in risk analysis and the intersection symbol, which looks like an upside down U means and, so always remember and for that. Uh, so in this case, uh, this is related to consequences. If a person does not evacuate and the flood depth at their location is greater than two feet, then they might have some probability of life loss. So risk analyses are, as you'll see when we get into event trees, are built off of these uh, sequences of events uh, and then the intersection of those events. In other words, all the events have to occur uh, to lead to failure and lead to consequences. Union, the, the symbol that looks kind of like a U means or. So it means either of the events could occur or they both could occur, right, in this case. So here we have two events, spillway monolith sliding maybe as one failure mode. Uh, an internal erosion initiating maybe as part of another failure mode. So the intersection of events means either one of those could occur individually or they both could occur uh, at the same time or during the same event. Another important thing uh, in risk analysis in terms of math and, and risk computations are event combinations. So combinations tells us how many different ways a particular um, event or outcome can occur. Uh, and it's for the cases where the order of the events um, is not important. So this is useful when the probability of failure for a potential failure mode depends on how many ways the failure mode could occur. So in this example, we have a gate failure uh, where the probability of failure and the associated consequences only depend on the number of gates that fail, not which, one, which specific ones fail or in what order they fail. We can use the binomial coefficient, which um, a graphical representation of that you may have seen is called Pascal's triangle. We can use that to uh, calculate the number of combinations that we have available to us for a specific scenario. So in this case, we have a dam with three spillway gates, and we want to ask ourselves the question, how many different ways could we have two spillway gates that fail? So we can plug those numbers into the binomial coefficient, and you'll see the results in the table on the right. Three shaded rows are the cases for two spillway gate failures, right? So we could have the first and second gate fail, the first and the third, or the second and the third. And then if we want to look at all the combinations of failure from zero, one, two, or three spillway gate failures, right? We can fill out that whole table and we get, you know, we know how many combinations there are from, from this binomial coefficient. And then uh, in the bottom right, the graphic there shows a depiction of all eight combinations in terms of a Venn diagram where each circle is an individual gate failure and the overlaps uh, represent the cases of multiple gate failures. So we can do it numerically in a type table or uh, graphically. Permutations is uh, another way to count ways in which things can occur. So this uh, permutations are relevant when the order of the events is relevant. There's a little formula there uh, for calculating up the number of permutations, and uh, we'll just talk about it here more so from an example. So this is ex an example where we have a river system, and you'll see a presentation uh, towards the end of the week on risk for river systems. In this case, uh, it's a simple system with two dams and one levee, and we want to know how many different ways could we have two, two failures occur, right? So of the two dams and one levee, what if two of those, two of the three fail? How many different ways can that happen? And the order matters because uh, in this case, we're assuming that the order affects consequences, right? If, if one of the dams fails first and then overtops the downstream levee, right? That's different than if the levee fails first and the dam fails later. So the order might matter in this particular case. So uh, we start with our combinations. So using the formula from the previous slide, for three items and two failures. And then for each combination, because the order matters, we can calculate an additional two permutations for, um, for n and r equals two. So in this case, when we have, um, um, in this example, for two failures, we have actually six permutations. So we have uh, three combinations and two permutations for each combination gives us a total of six. And again, you can see them sit in the, in the highlighted rows in the table on the right. And you can see they're ordered in each 
each of the combination. So like, if you look at row five and row six, uh, it's the two dams failing, but in a different, in a different order, right? So that's why we end up with more permutations. And these, you know, it doesn't take very many items in your system for these to get, um, these lists to get really large, but it's important to at least um, consider them. And oftentimes in a risk analysis, and often identify them. And then sometimes we can screen out the ones that are just like we screen out their moods. We can screen out the ones that are less likely to be a significant contributor to the risk. All right, let's get into probability theory. So probability theory is our formal math framework that we use for risk analysis. Key concepts here, probability theory is how we quantify the likelihood of things occurring. So whether it be loading performance or consequences, and in, in the subjective interpretation, we use it to uh, assign a likelihood that expresses our judgment or our expert opinion on a particular event. Probability space, we can describe in the Venn diagram uh, where the size of the events we sketch can be equal to their probabilities. So we can not only show the events, but we can show their probability relative to each other by sizing their shapes. Um, these are the three fundamental rules of probability. So this everything in probability and statistics is built off of these three uh, rules or axioms. So every probability has to be a non-negative real number, which means it has to be something greater than or equal to zero. Um, the probability of these of the event that is certain to occur is one. So these first two rules tells, tell us that every probability estimate has to be between zero and one for a given event. And then the last one, the probability of the union uh, of two mutually exclusive events. So remember union uh, means or, right? A or B um, is equal to the sum of their probabilities. So if they're mutually exclusive, we can just add them up to get the total probability. So all the formulas we use are built off of these three rules. Um, there are two commonly used interpretations of probability. One is called a physical objective or frequentist probability. It comes from observed data. So we might keep track of how many times spillway flow occurs at our dam. And from that data, we can calculate that spillway, we've seen spillway flow on average uh, two times out of every 10 years. So we get probabilities that way. The other one, which is really common in risk analysis because there's not data or calculations for every uh, every ferry mode and every part of every ferry mode is evidential uh, degree of belief, subjective or Bayesian. You'll see all these terms used for this type of probability. It's subjective, it's basically a weighting of the evidence and an expression of your expert opinion. So, for example, we have evidence that, you know, the chance of monolith cracking is 3% based on uh, the structural engineering experts, uh, construction records, concrete strength tests, finite element analysis, and observed performance of similar dams in, in our portfolio. Um, so again, this is kind of a compilation of all the evidence into, into a probability that expresses what we believe based on all the information we have. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit, transition a little bit, talk about some of the relationships between events and the calculations that go with them. So events are statistically dependent if the occurrence of one event has an effect on the probability for some other event. So event tree pathways, we'll get into event trees later in the week, assume events are statistically dependent along pathways. So for example, the probability of say liquefaction in a dam depends on the magnitude of the peak ground acceleration. Or the fatality rate for consequences may depend on the amount of warning time folks have to allow them to a chance to evacuate. Second type is conditional probability. So conditional probability is again commonly used in event tree analysis, as you'll see throughout the week. It means the probability of an event occurring um, assumes that some other previous event uh, has occurred or uh, is known to have occurred or assumed to have occurred. So the notation there is uh, probability of A with that vertical bar and then B, which means the probability that event A occurs given that event B has already occurred. So you'll see this commonly in event trees to deal with statistical dependence. So the probability in this example of slope instability given a flood loading at the top of the levee. So when we estimate probabilities, we're often estimating them conditionally on other uh, events. 
So this is what that looks like graphically, right? So for statistically dependent events, the probability of initiation of some failure mode might depend on the reservoir water surface elevation. That's what RWS means. So in this case, uh, the total probability initiation is 0 0.05, but the, the probability is different depending on what the reservoir water surface elevation is. So in this simple example, it's split into two categories for reservoir water surface elevation above and below 300. And if you have a stage greater than 300 feet, your probability of initiation is actually larger. It's 0.1 um, compared to the overall probability of initiation. So that makes sense, right? If, as the load gets higher, the probability of initiation probably gets higher as well in most cases. So uh, this is what that looks like visually, and this is how we, um, and, and this is why um, considering these additional probabilities is, is going to be really important when we do risk analysis. Statistically independent events is kind of just the opposite of dependent. If the occurrence of one event has no effect on the probability for some other event, we call them statistically independent. And we express that by writing the conditional probability of P of A given B is just equal to P of A. So uh, whatever happens with B has no effect on the probability of A. Um, so oftentimes uh, individual potential failure modes in, in our simple uh, risk assessment models, we assume they are statistically independent and we estimate uh, the performance or system response probabilities for individual failure modes, typically assuming they are independent. So what does that look like? Um, so probability, uh, another graphical example, probability of initiation due to um, a flaw that has some probability. In this case, maybe it's some sort of flaw in the foundation of our dam or levy. And if logically, we in most cases, we wouldn't expect the existence of the flaw to be dependent on the reservoir water surface, right? It's either there or it's not. So no matter what the reservoir water surface is, your probability of a flaw is the same. It's point, in this example, it's 0.1 or 10%. So it's um, statistically independent of the reservoir water surface. So again, these things come into play when we start defining ferry modes and building event trees to make sure we understand whether events are dependent, independent, and how they relate to one another. <clears throat> okay, now some math. So I'm gonna cover three or four, I think it's four, four basic rules um, that you will use a lot in risk analysis. The first is the rule of subtraction. Remember at the beginning of the presentation, I I talked about complementary events. The so rule subtraction is commonly used for that. Um, we often use it to calculate the probability of non-failure uh, off of the probability of failure, right? So if the probability of failure is P of A, the probability of not failing is one minus P of A. Second one is rule of mu multiplication. These are for intersections of events. You will use these for event trees to multiply probabilities along event tree pathways to get a risk estimate. Um, and it, as the name implies, it's just a multiplication, right? So if probability if events A and B both occur leading to failure, then the probability of failure is can come from the probability of A times the probability of B given A has occurred. Third one is the rule of addition. So this is where we combine uh, risk estimates across the end branches of our event trees. Again, you'll see this later in the week to get total risk estimates. So we might be combining risk estimates for individual failure modes. Um, the row addition says we can add the two probabilities, and then if there um, uh, if there is some intersection event between the two, we have to subtract that out essentially so we don't double count it. Um, if they're mutually exclusive, if there is no intersection because A and B can't both occur um, if they're mutually exclusive. So and if we if they either are mutually exclusive or we make a simplifying assumption that they are, uh, say, example, for some failure modes, we can just add them up and get a total risk estimate. And Morgan's rule, this is a bit of a shortcut. The theory stuff is on the left. I'm not going to cover that. You can, you know, if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can you can look at that at your leisure later on. Uh, but in practice, what we use to Morgan's Rule four is to get total probabilities, and you'll see in the exercise that we're going to do after this talk um, why we do that. It just makes it much easier to calculate total probabilities uh, when we combine De De Morgan's rule with the rule of subtraction. So, for example, here we can get a total probability of failure by taking one minus the product of one minus p, where p would be the probability of failure 
for each of the individual ferry modes. So this is just kind of a simple mathematical shortcut that we use a lot in risk analysis. A few other concepts to cover correlation. So correlation talks about the statistical relationship between events. So you can either have low correlation, positive or negative correlation. Um, Pearson's coefficient is one of the ways we use to measure linear correlation. And we use it to um, well predictive relationships, right? So that we can predict uh, some input to risk analysis from some other input. Unimodal bounds. So unimodal bounds is uh, another way we can put bounds on our risk estimates, right? So uh, we don't often know how much ferry modes might be correlated, but we can put bounds assuming they're either perfectly correlated or perfectly uncorrelated. If they are un uncorrelated, we use um, De Morgan's rule. That's typically what's done in practice. If they're perfectly correlated, then the, uh, the dominant or maximum uh, ferry mode probability is going to be the total. Central limit theory, this gets, ties into when we start doing um, Monte Carlo and related things, right? So this is just a good thing to have in your back pocket. When you have um, an analysis that's that's made up of, of adding or multiplying operations and you have lots of input distributions that are uncertain, uh, when you combine them with addition, the results are always going to trend towards a normal. And when you have multiplication there or division, they're always going to trend towards a long normal. So it's just a good Good thing to have in your back pocket and be aware of. Another thing good to have in your back pocket is the law of large numbers. So uh, when we do Monte Carlo analysis, uh, when you do a large number of trials, uh, the sample mean will converge to the population mean as long as we do enough um, iterations in our Monte Carlo analysis. We can have huge uncertainty uh, if our sample size is too small, so we often need thousands to millions of Monte Carlo simulations. Another good useful trick in risk analysis, you'll see a lot of our risk calculations, as, as I think was mentioned earlier, are calculated over the full range of loading. So we usually um, estimate it at discrete points and do a lot of linear interpolation in between. So this concept of linearizing data is a good concept, again, to have in your back pocket to improve the accuracy of your risk calculations. The idea is that if your relationship is nonlinear, if you can find a way to transform it to make it more linear, you get a more accurate interpolation. So here we have a system response curve, probability failure on the vertical axis stage on the horizontal axis. It's a nonlinear function, but it turns out if we transform it um, based on a normal distribution, we get something that's very close to being linear, uh, and we can get a much better estimate uh, as we're interpolating uh, in our risk calculations and risk model. Now we'll move on to some statistics concepts. First concept we're gonna talk about that's fundamental is random variables. So that's how we describe these events that we talked about earlier in the presentation. So it's used to represent an event or some parameter that can take on some set of values. So again, spillway flow, you know, the, the spillway flow occurring rate might be our random variable and its value might be that it's twice every 10 years, two out of um, so the likelihood of, of the event uh, is described by our probabilities. You see some examples listed there, and there are two basic types of random variables. Uh, the ones that are discrete, we have specific set of outcomes, like maybe number of spillway gates, or continuous, we have an infinite number of outcomes, like the peak ground acceleration, right, which in, in theory could be any value. Here's how we graphically and mathematically describe distributions for our uh, random variables in risk analysis. So when they're discrete, um, we can use probability mass functions, right? Which gives us um, the event on the horizontal axis and the probability on the vertical axis. So the left is a mass function where each event has a probability. And then we can also portray it as a cumulative distribution, right? Where we accumulate the probabilities. Um, so it gives us the total probability or any value less than or equal to the value that we're showing here, right? So on the left, probability of two spillway gates failing is estimated at 0 0.1. And on the right, the probability of one or fewer, right? Remember, it's always less than or equal to uh, spillway gates failing is 0.888. That's the cumulative probability. So you'll see these types of graphics a lot as ways to portray um, random variables in a risk analysis. When they're continuous, we describe them with probability density functions. So everybody remembers kind of the um, 
bell curve for a normal distribution uh, for the density and the S curve for the cumulative distribution. So this is kind of what that is uh, similar to in these two graphics. So on the left is a density function, which describes the density of a probability. Um, so to get a probability from that, we always have to take some range and calculate essentially the integral, which is the area under the density function. So the probability of a PGA between 0.1 and 0.2 is just the integral between those two values. And in this example, it's 0.23. And then if we portray it as a cumulative distribution function, which is the one shown on the right, we can get the same information, right? We just get it a slightly different way because these two plots are related to each other. So in the plot on the right, if we want the probability uh, for PGA between 0.1 and 0.2, we can take the cumulative probability of 0.1 cumulative probability of 0.2 and take the difference between them. So we do um, loading and risk analysis and we break up our loading into um, load intervals. The right hand depiction is what that looks like. Exceedance curve is just the complement. So remember complement is one minus, right? So the complement of the cumulative distribution function is called an exceedance curve or survival function. So you'll typically see Seismic and flood hazard curves express this way. All right, statistics. I think I'm running out of time, Adam. How much farther do you want me to go, or do you want me to stop here pretty soon? We've got about five minutes, Dave. So okay, finish up. I will. Yep, I will get through it. So different ways to describe random variables. So you know, common ones are central tendency, which are mean, median, and mean. Mean is just the average. Median is the 50th percentile, which means there's a 50% chance of above and 50% below. And mode is most likely, which means it's the highest point on your, the highest density on your probability density function. Um, variance is the second moment. Um, so it is the spread of your data, right? How, how wide is the distribution? You can think of it that way. So standard deviation is one way to measure it. It's the square root of the variance. And the coefficient of variation is a normalized version of that. Or we can take the standard deviation divided by the mean. And then skew is the third moment, which is a uh, measure of symmetry. So in the plot on the left, it has a positive skew, uh, which means it's not symmetrical and it has that long tail to the right. So the third moment is a way to, to describe that. Some common probability distributions we use in risk analysis, uniform we use to generate random numbers, often in Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, normal is just because it commonly shows up in nature because of the central limit theorem that I mentioned earlier. PERT is one we use a lot for expert elicitation um, because it's really easy to use. Uh, it requires a, a, a low, a minimum value, a maximum value, and a most likely member. Most likely is the mode value, and we can describe a nice smooth distribution with only three numbers that come out of an expert elicitation. So that's really common for that application. Triangular is also fairly common, but it's um, a little less desirable than the PERT, mainly because of the lack of smoothness. Um, log normal, again, I mentioned because of central limit theorem, right? A lot of things look similar to log normal. The characteristic of log normal is that it's bounded. So if you have some variable like discharge, right, that can't be less than zero, uh, you can use a log normal or one of something in the family of log normal to bound it at zero. Um, and then Weibull, uh, Weibull is often used in um, reliability analysis to look at uh, probability of failure over time. Where in the early stages you have you know high failures during uh, due to defects, steady state in the useful life, and then uh, a rapid increase as things wear out. We out of time, Adam. We got a couple more minutes. Yes. All right, I'm going to skip the base. I'm, I'm just Bayesian inference is really just the way of doing subjective probability. I'm going to skip this example. You can you can look at it at your leisure. Um, Monte Carlo is really common and important in risk analysis. We use it uh, often for uncertainty analysis. And here are the key steps. The really key step is first you got to be able to build a model in the deterministic world. If you don't build a good model, then Monte Carlo is pointless, right? The next thing is once we've built that model. We can assign probability distributions to the inputs. We can sample those. We can calculate the outputs. We can run that many, many times. And then we get probability distributions for our outputs, which in risk analysis 
will be things like uh, the uncertainty in an in a annualized life loss estimate, and you'll see that throughout the week. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of these slides. Oh, I'm at the conclusion. Well, I'm not going to skip them. This is just the, the common technique we use to do um, sampling in Monte Carlo. So if you get into risk analysis and into Monte Carlo, this is one of the fundamental techniques you'll have to be familiar with and know. So we generate random numbers between zero and one because they're super easy to generate. We can then apply those random numbers to the cumulative distribution. So the uncertainty distribution of our model input, uh, whatever that might be, maybe it's you know flood discharge or ground acceleration or probability of failure, whatever it might be, um, to get a random sample of um, inputs to our Monte Carlo that match the distribution of the variable we're trying to model, right? So again, this is just a simple way, and it's the most common way of doing it. Um, all right, so to wrap things up, sorry that was really fast, it's a lot of material. It's like a semester's worth of material con condensed into 20 minutes. So, in, so to conclude things here, uh, again, remember risk analysis is built on set theory, probability theory, and statistics. We want to have a really good foundation. We don't want the numbers or the calculations to be a black box. The formulas are exact, right? They follow the rules of probability, but the assumptions and inputs are often just that assumptions, right? So they're not perfect. Um, but using good assumptions and good models is essential to get a good risk analysis. And that we do that through a solid application of theory and, and formulas. So, again, I would encourage you, if, if it's been a while since you've done probability and statistics, I would encourage you to do more than just this lecture kind of to, to brush up on some of these concepts and just reach out to, to myself or, or probably anyone else in the RMC if you ever run into any questions or issues on these topics that you want some help with. Thanks, Dave. Any questions for Dave on probability and statistics?